The next company presenting is Saitori, and presenting for them is Doug Arm, Senior Vice President of Operations. So uh, good afternoon, and um, happy to be here, um, having made the arduous half-mile trek from Saitori to this facility. It's um, you know, really what I wanted to do today is give you a little bit of background about Saitori, but rather than kind of the straight corporate overview, I want to spend a little time and talk about uh, uh, some of our more recent kind of uh, partnering and, and scientific uh, activities. Saitori is a public company, and so please uh, pay attention to the safe harbor statement. Saitori's technology really derives from adipose tissue and uses a real-time approach to generate stem and regenerative cells from that tissue at the point of care. It's a device-based approach, and as a result of this process, we end up with a very concentrated mixed population of, of these adipose-derived regenerative cells, or ADRCs. This technology has the benefit of being autologous, and we like to say it's virtually off the shelf. Now, we can argue over semantics on that, but to the physician, this is what we're trying to achieve. Now, there's, you know, as we've gone from feasibility to, you know, prototypes to clinical development with our system, we keep refining, enhancing, getting greater efficiencies, and so by the time we reach, you know, full global commercialization, we expect this process to be very streamlined, not just on the cell processing side, but on the tissue harvest side, as well as on the delivery side. So it's a challenge, though, and as was mentioned in the pa panel before, you know, we, we are one of those companies. We're not allogeneic, cultured model. It's not going to be something that's just handed to, uh, you know, the physician from the pharmacy. However, you know, we, we've traded in their challenges for a whole new set of challenges. They've got their own, and ours really stemmed from trying to arrange those logistics. Of course, we've got to demonstrate the safety and efficacy as well. With this mixed population, we have um, multiple mechanisms in play here. And it's not just, of course, the stem cells that are contained in there. There's about 1 to 2 percent of the traditional stem cells, um, about uh, two to three orders of magnitude greater than what's found in uh, fresh bone marrow. However, what we've really found in our development uh, activities is that it's some of the other mechanisms that seem to be much more prominent, the uh, anti-apatotic, immunomodulatory, uh, paracrine expression that have uh, been seen to be the primary drivers of, of uh, results in our cardiac and other programs. Just to quickly touch on our pipeline here, really, we have been focused on two primary areas. One is heart disease. Saitori has completed a couple of pilot studies over in Europe, a uh, heart attack trial over there called um, Athena, I'm sorry, called uh, um, Apollo, which is then translated into a pivotal study currently underway called Advance. I'm not going to spend the time to talk about that, happy to talk about it uh, afterwards. We've also gone ahead and are now doing a U.S. trial in refractory heart disease. We've also spent a lot of time over the last few years uh, commercializing and studying soft tissue reconstruction, primarily in breast cancer reconstruction after lumpectomy or partial mastectomy. As a result of this, as well as some other uh, soft tissue activities, we've been able to parlay some of that work into an agreement with the U.S. government, and I'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. Finally, because of our device-based nature, we're able to get a CE mark over in Europe and be able to put the device out in the hands of interested physicians to do their own investigator-initiated translational research. And it was, as a result of that, I think we're able to generate some data that has uh, gone ahead and been part of the um, part, of, part of the driver that has led to this uh, partnership with the U.S. government. Quickly, just a uh, uh, quick update on some of the cardiac activities. Our precise trial was the pilot European heart failure study. And here you can see the results, and I think we've presented these before, out at 6 and 18 months. If you look at the max VO2, you can see that from the baseline levels of 19 over 6 and 18 months, the pa patients in the control population uh, really decreased to the point where they came close to the level that's traditionally described as requiring a transplant. 
for the cell-based population, for the treatment group, we were actually able to increase the VO2 max, and it's been stable over the 18 months of, uh, of, of di direct follow-up. And now that we've gone ahead and followed these patients out even further, we can see that there's been a significant difference in the mortality rate, where one out of only, 20, only one out of 21 patients in the treatment group has passed away as a, compared to two out of six in the, in the control group. Now, it's a relatively small study, recognize that. We're continuing these efforts not only in Europe, but now in the U.S. And so one of our major advancements in the last year has been working with the FDA and getting approval for the Athena trial, which is currently enrolling, we announced a few weeks ago. And we've got that going in six patients, or six sites. It's a 45 patient study that we expect to enroll over the course of the next year. So one of the things that we've talked about recently is um, an agreement with uh, the U.S. government, and in particular, BARDA. And BARDA, uh, as many of you know, is the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. And their mission is really to look at countermeasures to help the general population in the event of a public health threat. And this could be you know, pandemic uh, uh, illnesses, uh, as well as um, you know, terrorist type activities that might result in biological or radiation radiation or nuclear type of activities. Um, in particular, in when, they started, when we started talking with them and focusing in on where we had synergies, we wound up talking about the fact that a, a, a nuclear device could inf impact in a major metropolitan area somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 10,000 patients. But if you look at the whole of the United States, there's less than 2,000 burn beds spread all across. And so it creates a situation where there's not nearly enough um, special, specialty care to deal with the type of injuries that would result from that type of attack. In addition, 40% of those are, are occupied, and much of the care that's currently uh, given to those seriously burned patients requires uh, significant specialist attention. <coughs> So what we needed to do was demonstrate to BARDA that our technology could potentially be synergistic with what they're trying to achieve in that if we can demonstrate that our technology is already um, you know, spread in the marketplace, it's available, and it doesn't require anything beyond you know, general physician level uh, specialty to, to generate the cells and to apply them, then there might be an opportunity here to do some triaging over the first couple of days after such an activity. And this was something that they uh, were amenable to from a, from a business standpoint. From a scientific standpoint, this is an early, you know, this is a, this is a full blown contract as I'll get to in a minute, but it starts at the early phases of development. Um, we were able to show them, thanks to some of those investigator-initiated studies I uh, talked about earlier, that um, we can and have experience treating, although in small numbers, some radiation injuries as well as some thermal burns. Now, these are more in the chronic sense here, but you can see the top pictures are from a 90-year-old Japanese woman who had a, a significant radiation injury. This was four years uh, that she had this open wound. You can see the exposed sacrum. After debridement and uh, administration of the cells, over the course of six months, it co closed completely with a single treatment. So some, some nice, you know, this is just one case study here. In addition, we've got uh, uh, some experience in burn, and I'd like to point out this case below here. This is actually a nurse in Scotland who um, was uh, part of our uh, restore trial, uh, working with one of the sites in Glasgow. And she ultimately saw the value and the benefit that the cells could provide in that uh, breast cancer reconstruction application, thought about the mechanisms, and she, her personal experiences was that she got badly burned as a kid, and throughout her childhood and adolescence, she had had dozens of surgeries to try to reduce contracture and try to get some greater functionality in her arm. After seeing the results from Restore, she volunteered to be a guinea pig, and not only that, she also came to work for us. 
But um, what we were able to do with the single treatment here was really generate a lot of good, fresh tissue that the contracture has been resolved to, not completely, but to a large degree. The skin now tans like the rest of her body, and she's able to wear you know, short sleeve shirts and the like. So it's really changed her life, and it's been these types of case studies that I think resonated with the U.S. government. Now, just like uh, Dean Tozer was saying before, um, for smaller companies that are early in development, lots of partnerships are backloaded. And despite reports over the decades to the contrary, at least in our case, the government was the same way. Um, we really are focusing on these thermal burns in a way that we haven't looked at before. So to start with, the initial terms are for a little less than $5 million in preclinical funding to not only work on making sure that the cells do have application in these acute models, but that it will be able to be um, kind of aligned with our existing device and product line. Once we meet that proof of concept, that's when we get to the really uh, more significant portions of the contract because this is designed to go down the road for clinical development and through the FDA. So we think this is a, a, you know, a great opportunity, kind of a milestone for Saitori to get this type of validation from, uh, from BARDA. It's certainly a nice big number at the top, over 100 million, but again, it's performance-based, and we think the best thing about this is that it really aligns with some of the activities we've already been doing and we're going to continue to do, and BARDA will just help fund some of those ongoing activities. So I just want to transition here, though, and finish up with one of the things that um, I think is near and dear to my heart is with responsibility for the R&D group at Saitori. And, and that's to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the science side of, of the cells. And, you know, I, I want to thank the uh, Alliance for inviting me here this year, but what I really want to do is thank them for inviting me last year. Because last year at this time there was a, a couple of great panels and discussions on characterization and the need for standardization of assays and things like that that motivated us in Saitori to recognize, say, hey, we really haven't been public with everything we know about these cells. And one of the challenges we have with the device-based approach is that, you know, on the surface it looks like a box, right? It's a centrifuge with a box and it's fairly straightforward for someone to take a look at the space and say, well, I can't do what, you know, the Atherses and Osirises of the world are doing and grow a pharma type thing, but I can build a box. So we really felt the need to start getting more diligent scientific data out there and more, um, you know, be, being more precise in the way we were marketing things and promoting things because it was coming to our attention that people were saying, well, we can get stem cells from, from fat and what they really were doing wasn't exactly that. So I'll get to that in a second, but to start with, I want to talk a little bit about a couple of studies that we presented at IFATS here. And one of them is looking at microRNA characterization of ADRC, is really taking the characterization to the next level. We've looked at 3,000 plus uh, samples in Saitori. Great thing about being in San Diego, lots of plastic surgery, we're able to get these uh, fat tissue samples on a daily basis. So in combination with the, the folks at Systemic, we were able to take a look at the microRNA uh, profiles of, of a number of donors here, looked at the consistencies and found that there were over 200 microRNAs that were detected in each and every sample. And now this is relatively early work, but we then went back and took a look at those and broke them down and tried to start taking a look at how they fit into these multiple mechanisms that I talked about before. So this is really, I, I think, just a first step in what's going to be a, a, a good and diligent scientific process to tie in some of these uh, uh, greater characterization efforts to mechanisms and clinical outcomes. A couple of other studies that I uh, wanted to mention that we presented at IFATS a couple of weeks ago go back to really defining the stromal vascular fraction or the ADRC fraction that we get 
uh, as a result of the, the solution process. And you know, to start with on the base level, all cells that you get out of fat are not stem cells. But you wouldn't know that by some of the reports out there. So we started with a little bit of theoretical image analysis and, and histomorphometry and, and, and recognized that, hey, you know, nucleated cells, this is, there's only so much you can do. Finally, we're able to, you know, after, like I said, 3,000 uh, samples, 10 years, you know, we've got a very good understanding of what types of cells these are that make up this heterogeneous mix. Flow cytometry on fat-derived uh, cells is not easy, but we do have this understanding, and so I think it's important to caution and something we're trying to, to make sure that the general uh, clinical audience understands is that it's not just getting an exaggerated number of stem cells out of fat. They're not just all stem cells, and they're not all just stem and regenerative cells. There are many other cells that don't have the activity that we've been researching for years and years. So I know I'm probably about to go over, so I just really want to touch on the fact that what we're trying to show is that the amount of development and research activity that we put in on our enzyme-based real-time approach is something that isn't as simple as it looks. There are other ways people have talked about getting stem and regenerative cells from fat that do not use enzyme-based approaches. And I'm here to tell you, I'm not saying that they do or don't work, but they're different. And so everything that we've done from a safety standpoint, everything that we've looked at from a preclinical and clinical uh, effectiveness standpoint is not something that can be replicated just by saying, hey, we work on fat and we get cells from it as well. We really have to be more diligent as an industry, and we take responsibility for this at Saitori, to say, hey, if you use something like emulsification, you're getting a different population. If you use something like ultrasonic processing rather than an enzymatic processing, you get something different, and you can't go applying the cell population that you're getting and piggyback off of the same, uh, of, the, of the decades worth of work that we're getting and that we've demonstrated and that we've shared with the regulatory agencies in Europe and with the FDA. All of this for us leads to really a, a benefit on not only clarity on the regulatory front, but on the intellectual property and competitive side as well. And it's something that I think we can translate from this basic, more basic and advanced understanding of, of the, our particular population of cells to, um, you know, to, to next generational products and applications. So with that, uh, thanks very much for your attention. I appreciate it.